My name is Ellen Zwornstein. I'm the executive director at the Michigan Center for Civic Education, and I'll be your facilitator for this hearing. The judges are all now here in this space. And as you know, they will introduce themselves. They will ask you to introduce yourselves. We'll read the question and then we'll have the hearing and I'll hold up time cards in this window um, to indicate where you might be at. And if we do see uh, your teacher uh, coming into the room, I will admit her. Just know that you might see a video and then we'll, we'll get the video off um, when she comes into the space. All right, have a wonderful hearing. Congratulations, everybody. Good afternoon, is everybody ready? <clears throat> I'm Rita McCannon. We're here to do unit three with you. And first, uh, we'll let the judges tell you who they are. Hi, everybody. I am Tom Bontz, and I'm a professor of education at Kansas State University. Hello, everyone. My name is Darcy Kern. I'm a history professor at Southern Connecticut State University. I guess I should have remembered to say I'm a lawyer in Huntsville, Alabama, and I will also be a judge. If you all would tell us who you are and, and we'll get ready to go. Hello, we are Unit 3 from Grant High School in Portland, Oregon. My name is Quinn Bennett. My name is Ty Halper. My name is Maya Rashid. And my name is Natalie Polrak. Welcome. Um, we're going to do question one and I will read it to you and then we'll see what you want to talk about. Quoting Oliver Wendell Holmes, I do not think the United States would come to an end if we lost our power to declare an act of Congress void. I do think the union would be imperiled if we could not make that declaration as to the laws of the several states. What impact has judicial review had on federalism? Is judicial review a counter-majoritarian practice? Please support your position. What limits, if any, would you place on the practice of judicial review? We look forward to hearing from you. Please begin. Judicial review has had a profound impact on federalism, both positive and negative. In his quote, Justice Holmes makes the same distinction as made in the Supremacy Clause. That the Constitution and the laws of Congress are superior to any contradictory state laws, but not explicitly above laws of Congress. Holmes was mainly concerned about the negative impact of state laws on national commerce. In three landmark cases, Fletcher v. Peck, McCook v. Maryland, and Gibbons v. Ogden, the Supreme Court used judicial review to make the first significant impact on federalism when it invalidated state statutes that promoted state economic interests at the expense of national commerce. Judicial review's most significant impacts on federalism came several decades after the adoption of the 14th Amendment, which prohibited states from denying due process and equal protection. The Supreme Court uh, interpreted the Due Process Clause, starting with Gitlow v. New York in 1925, to incorporate sections of the Bill of Rights against the states through the power of judicial review. Through substantive due process, the Supreme Court has since interpreted the liberty component of the due process clause to imply fundamental rights from the Constitution. In Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965, the Supreme Court struck down a state statute under a right to privacy found in sections of the Bill of Rights. Privacy was later used to strike down state laws against abortion in Roe v. Wade and gay marriage in Obergefell v. Hodges. On one level, judicial review absolutely is a counter-majoritarian practice. Unelected federal judges have the power to overturn laws that reflect the will of the majority. The Constitution actually protects judges' ability to make unpopular decisions, as Article 3, Section 1 gives them life tenure and ensures that their salary will not be diminished while they're in office. On the other hand, Judicial review is so ingrained in our government that virtually no one questions its legitimacy or the Marbury v. Madison decision. While some of the ways that judicial review is used, like substantive due process, are controversial, judicial review as a whole is a widely accepted aspect of our Constitution. Also, when judicial review is applied, it is enforcing a Constitution which has been adopted by the people. The Supreme Court already limits itself in many respects. 
Courts can limit the scope of judicial review with the political question doctrine, in which courts refuse to decide cases where an issue has been committed to the political branches of government. The doctrine can also be applied when there exists no judicially manageable standards distinguishing constitutional from unconstitutional laws. Courts can also limit the scope of judicial review with the demanding interpretation of standing, applying the requirement of Article 3 that federal courts decide cases and controversies. Though we support reforms on the court itself, we don't support any additional limitations on the practice of judicial review because it would prevent the Supreme Court from checking the unconstitutional actions of other branches or the states. There are substantial benefits to broad powers of judicial review. For example, the ability to interpret the 14th Amendment to provide substantive due process rights to all inhabitants of the country has expanded civil liberties in cases like Griswold v. Connecticut, Loving v. Virginia, and Lawrence v. Texas. As Alexander Hamilton argued in Federalist 78, the independence of judges is required to guard the Constitution and the rights of individuals that it protects. Without the Supreme Court exercising judicial review, rights that are not supported by legislative majorities, like same-sex marriage, will never be protected. Thank you. We are ready for your questions. Okay, thank you all. Um, tell me about uh, your opinion about the judicial nomination and confirmation process in the Supreme Court in Washington. Um, would you propose any change in the nomination or confirmation process and why? I would propose that there has to be a uniform standard for nominating judges. We saw in the end of President Obama's term, he was not allowed to appoint a new Supreme Court justice because there wasn't enough time left. When President Trump was at the end of his term, he had notably less time than President Obama, yet he was able to appoint a justice. And this made the Supreme Court seem more political in the eyes of the public. So there has to be a standard for how long or how much time left in a president's term that there can be a new judicial appointee. We could also reenact the judicial filibuster because this might uh, make it so we have more nonpartisan judges because you would need a larger majority to elect them. You would need 60 votes instead of a simple majority. You um, say that you do not support any reform of judicial review itself. Um, has the Supreme Court ever made a mistake? And if so, um, what is the recourse that people have against the Supreme Court ruling incorrectly? Well, judicial review has been used incorrectly before. Uh, the most famous example being Dred Scott v. Sanford, where the court ruled that slaves were property and all laws that deprived slave owners of their slaves were unconstitutional. Now, the recourse for that, for that was that we needed uh, eventually a civil war, and then after that, three post-war amendments that strengthened federal power and overturned that decision. Uh, so it's very hard to overturn a judicial review case if it is bad. However, we have gotten better with it, with things like the courts overruling themselves and overruling previous past precedents. An example of the court overruling itself is with the case of Brown v. Board overruling the case of Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson was a bad example of judicial review because it applied the separate but equal doctrine where separate but equal was inherently unequal. But with Brown v. Board, the court was able to overrule its decision by upholding segregation in Plessy versus Ferguson, but not upholding segregation in Brown v. Board of Education and admitting it was wrong and admitting that times have changed and that they can apply a new standard now. Another example was Shelby County v. Holder in 2013, where they overturned Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, even though it had just been passed through Congress again with a very large majority. And something that they're doing to, um, you know, against this is the new John Lewis Voting Rights Act has been proposed, which will hopefully replace the old Voting Rights Act. And finally, another example of a poor judicial or a poor act of judicial review was Bush v. Gore, um, that famous 2000 case that decided the election of 2000, um, because many feel that this delegi delegitimatized the court and the court ruling on a presidential election is counter-majoritarian. 
But isn't it true on the whole judicial review has increased the power of the federal government, the national government substantially vis-a-vis -vis the states? And uh, on the whole, has that been a good thing, a bad thing? Uh, what do you think? Well, on one hand, so the federal government is getting more power by striking down state laws, but they're also increasing individual rights. In cases like Griswold v. Connecticut, state power was diminished, but um, individual rights were protected by allowing married couples to purchase contraception. Um, in a case, in cases like Roe v. Wade, um, the state laws against abortion were struck down, but individual rights of women to choose to have an abortion were upheld. In Obergefell v. Hodges, state laws preventing same-sex marriage were struck down, but individual rights of same-sex couples to get married were protected. Okay, so those cases, uh, as you mentioned, um, are cases where the rights maybe aren't explicitly found in the Constitution and the court has to do some interpretation. So when the court's faced with a decision about increasing the power of the national government or uh, increasing the power of the state's government or the states retaining their power, what principles should guide them um, in, in making those decisions? Well, one principle that they already use as established in Calco v. Connecticut is, um, this is especially pertaining to incorporation cases they look to see if it's fundamental to the ordered scheme of liberty. Another principle that they could use, which has been used in the case of Washington and Gupsburg, is the court can ask if a right is deeply rooted in the history and tradition of the nation. And this principle may lead to uh, a more deferential standard of judicial review and maybe leading to more cases upholding the rights of the states and less cases or fewer cases upholding the rights of the federal government. Okay, forget for a second what the court says we should do. What do you think as citizens should guide the court's um, decisions about the division of power in our federal system as cases come before them? I think the court should always be careful to not overstep its power but I think when faced with upholding individual liberties or states' rights, I think the court should uphold individual liberties. Yeah, I believe that they have to strike a good balance between state power and national power, obviously, because anything other would uh, erode our key American principle of federalism. However, I do think that the expansions of federal power, the large expansions through things like the Commerce Clause in cases like Wickard v. Filburn, uh, have been mostly positive and had le have led to, I guess, economic advances for the entire nation, which thus helps every state. We would also need to, we also need to examine the reliability um, of other people on the things that the Supreme Court is ruling on. So, in for example, in cases like Roe v. Wade, many women rely on the on that decision on the decision that it is their right to choose. Also, Justice Kennedy talks about how he believes that the Supreme Court should be a reflection of the people and because what's fundamental changes drastically over time and I definitely agree with that. Reflection, excuse me, let me follow up on that just right quick and then I need to let Darcy ask a question, but a, a reflection of the times, the people, and how they think right now, or a reflection of the rights of the people. I would, I would specifically refer to something like when the court rules for people, but not maybe for the majority of the country. Well, there's always the balance of a more deferential standard of judicial review, and sometimes the court um, will need to not uh, make a decision because it's not, uh, the people aren't ready for it. Um, this could be seen with ruling so late on Loving versus Virginia or Obergefell v. Hodges because they didn't think the public was ready for them to decide on interracial marriage or same-sex marriage. And so there is a very delicate ba balance between um, making sure they're ruling at the right time to keep their legitimacy because if they don't have any legitimacy left, no one will enforce their decisions. 
However, after ruling such as Loving v. Virginia and Obergefell v. Hodges, we did see a national rise in the acceptance of these two things. It sounds like there's a real tension here between politics and politics infiltrating Supreme Court decisions and upholding rights and the rule of law. And, you know, back to this idea of balance, how does the Supreme Court maintain its position as a reviewer rather than legislating and, and allowing politics to creep into it through legislative action, essentially? I mean, well, some can argue that the Supreme Court shouldn't use substantive due process at all, and it shouldn't decide cases about abortion or privacy or same-sex marriage because it's turning itself into too much of a policymaker. Um, people like Chief Justice John Roberts or Justice Thomas will often argue that uh, cases like Obergefell v. Hodges has turned the court into a policymaker and is overturning the will of legislative majorities and enforcing a view upon the entire nation and possibly making the court lose its legitimacy. So there definitely is an argument for the court to not be using, to, for the court to use a more deferential standard of judicial review and not make decisions that will make it look like it's policymaking. However, as a queer person that lives in the United States of America, the liberty aspect that is used in substantive due process for me personally is huge in my future and in my rights. However, I would say that the court has been more delegitimizing itself through things like we've mentioned earlier. Oh, may I finish my thought? Uh, like rushing through Justice Coney Barrett's uh, nomination with only a simple majority rather than Merrick Garland's that needed a uh, filibuster passed vote. I think what I was what I was looking for, if I can um, start the the responding to your presentation, um, I wondered if you're you're concerned about uh, making things more legitimate when when they came out with the Brown v. Board decision, people were not, at least nationally, not not terribly happy with it. And but it was the right thing to do for uh, for minority rights. And then uh, some of what you're saying, I would I would wonder how we square all that. It, judges, would you all like to chime in and talk about their presentation? Sure, um, Oregon, great, um, great performance uh, today. Um, I, I, I really, you know, it's cl clear and obvious that you know a tremendous amount about Unit Three, and um, and and in particular about judicial review. Had we had more time, uh, I think you were kind of the the only group so far that um, casts some suspicion on uh, Marbury versus Madison uh, actually, uh, you know, finding uh, the power of judicial review at the national level inside the constitution. And as, as you know, historians disagree uh, on that point. Uh, on my question, uh, however, about the division of power, about federalism, and um, the role of the Supreme Court and that the role that it's played and the role that it should play uh, in, the, in the future. Um, you leaned heavily on, on Supreme Court decisions. You know, um, you, you um, stated the two tests that we use to find the fundamental right uh, in, the, in the Constitution. But sometimes, it, which is good, all that's good, but we, we also want you to think for yourselves as citizens beyond just what's in the Constitution, what the court said, what do you say as an interpreter of the Constitution, right? So uh, yeah, you might have thought about, you know, things that are national in scope uh, need to be, uh, those need to be really protected by the things that are super important, like fundamental rights and uh, those rights in the Bill of Rights and things that interfere with the political process, those kinds of things. So, um, so just a, a small critique, but uh, overall, uh, excellent job. 
Yeah, I thought you guys did a very good job. You answered my question on whether the court has ever gotten it wrong. I thought you answered that very well. Each one of you gave a specific case. Um, and I think you, you really um, nailed just how difficult the balance is on some of these issues. There's so much tension. And you know, sort of what you were arguing is that there's a lot of tension between the Ninth and the Tenth Amendments, which re which rights are reserved to the people and which to the state. And the Supreme Court has kind of come in and sided with the people, you could say, more than the states. Um, and I thought you did a great job. And and even bringing up, you know, some other views such as Clarence Thomas and John Roberts, I thought that was very good too to know that there is a group of jurists. Um, who who argue that substantive due process shouldn't be used um, or used in the way that it is. So I, you know, this was a very thought provoking and very good, um, very good panel. I appreciate it so much. Thank you all for your hard work and congratulations on on your work today and the rest of the way through. Thanks.